I'm going to talk to you tonight about one aspect of universities. I've been doing this for about 25 years. The story is about transferring results of research into the marketplace. It's the continuation of research. This field is called technology transfer, and I think we can do a better job at it. What's the difference between these mice? Their size. The size is due to the production of growth hormone. The larger mouse produces more, smaller mouse less. The mouse in the middle from this experiment basically is the control or the natural stage. This work was done in the late 1980s in the laboratories of John Kopchak and Wen Chen at Ohio University. What they did is they took the mouse growth hormone molecule, genetically modified it, inserted it into the embryo, and then transplanted the embryo into a mother host mouse. When the mice were born, they exhibited these characteristics as they grew up. Pretty cool, but so what? A couple years after they did this, we got involved in pursuing and uh, applying for a patent, and then in 1992, started a company based upon this technology with some entrepreneurs and some people from the lab. The purpose of the company was to create a drug for acromegaly. Acromegaly is called human giantism. You may know that from, at this time, the, the uh, professional wrestler on Andre the Giant, seven foot four, and his size was due to an overproduction of growth hormone. A couple years after we started that company, it was purchased by a pharmaceutical company, and that company pursued clinical trials for the drug. In 2003, it was approved by the Food and Drug Administration and they started marketing the drug. Today, it's a common part of the medication for acromegaly. That's technology transfer, taking something from the laboratory, moving it through, protecting it, moving it into a company and into the marketplace. I'm going to talk about a, another story that was in a later part of my career. Your grandmother comes to visit you. She's not well. She takes a couple of pills for some diseases that she has. While she's visiting you, she gets sicker. You take her to the doctor. The doctor does some tests, comes back and says, sorry to say, your grandmother's developing another disease. But there's a, a drug that's been recently approved, and it really slows the progression of that disease. So the doctor writes out a script. You take it to the pharmacy, the pharmacist fills it, you're in your car on the way home, and all of a sudden there's a call on your grandma's phone. Picks it up, it's the pharmacist. Wait, don't take that drug. Call your doctor. What's going on? Well, the field is called medication management. And about 13, 14 years ago, Professor Kevin Boson in the College of Pharmacy at the University of Arizona was studying medication management, in particular looking at drug interaction, going through the literature and all the data on drug interaction. He and his colleagues developed a software program. We commercialized that technology by licensing it to a company that was created in 2013. And a few years later, just not fairly recently, that company was purchased by a public company. At the time of that purchase, the company employed 250 people and managed drug interaction, medication management for 50 million people. That's technology transfer, moving from the laboratory and benefiting people. So where do these wicked cool inventions come from? Every year, the federal government supports research at universities to the tune of $30 billion. The research is typically funded by the research agencies like the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and others. Faculty 
apply for that research by submitting proposals. The proposals are reviewed. And about 10% of those proposals are funded. And that's a grant to the university to do the research. And that's how research is, is funded at, in, at most universities. So what do we get from that? What do we as taxpayers get from $30 billion? Four things. First, and I'm sure you've heard of this, the phrase, publish or perish. There are one million articles in technical, scientific, and medical journals published by faculty at U.S. universities. There are reports of research, the reports of the findings of research. This information goes into the body of knowledge, an expanding body that you and I now can access through the internet. The second are graduates. The people that are doing the work in the laboratories are typically graduate students, call them research assistants. When they complete their master's and doctoral degrees, they move out into the workforce. They are the knowledge workers of our advanced technology industries in this country. A third is intellectual property. There was a law passed in 1980 at the federal level that says that the inventions that are created from federally funded research are owned by the university. In 2015, there were 25,000 invention reports of research being done at the university reported to technology transfer offices. All universities have technology transfer offices. These reports are basically a sense that someone in the lab perceives the ability or the application of something that's going on there outside of the lab. Usually they're a kernel of an idea that has some data, and then what we do is we work to protect that through patents. The fourth thing is when we license this technology. Two types of companies receive technology from universities. Companies that are already in place that are looking to gain a competitive advantage by taking that technology in and then developing it. And the development period is anywhere from five to ten years. And then challenging the incumbent company in that marketplace. The other is startup companies. There were a thousand startup companies created in 2015 from, license, from technology at universities. I think we can do better than that. So when I think of these inventions, my metaphor is looking out across the horizon if you're on the beach and you're looking across the ocean and you're trying to figure out what the hell's going on out there. Is that an oil platform? Is that an ocean liner? Well, you can stand there and you can wait. And you can see, and maybe they move off, maybe it's stationary. Or you can pick up a pair of binoculars, amplify the situation and scope it out. That's akin to what we do. When these inventions come into us in a fairly embryonic state, what we do is there's two elements that are important in our analysis. First, is that technology as evident in the research, patentable. Can we develop commercial valid claims from that technology and can it issue as a patent? Second, we look at the marketplace. And I don't mean the marketplace today. Remember, these technologies take, after licensing, five to 10 years to get to a point of a product. We have to look at the market in the future. What are the characteristics of that market? What are the needs that market will have? When the needs are identified and we look at our technology and its characteristics or its features, and there's congruence, we have an asset. We have a commercial asset that we now need to find a home for in a company. If there's not congruence, well, the science behind that goes into the body of knowledge. 
This process for us at the university culminates in a license agreement. A license agreement is a legal document where one party confers rights to another party. We are granting the rights for the company to make products based upon the patents. In return, the company obligates itself to develop the technology. And as it moves into commercialization and their sales, we receive a small percentage of those sales as royalty. Universities have policies that dictate how royalties are, are divided, and they're fairly consistent across universities. The largest share typically goes to the inventor, or the inventor group, which often includes a graduate assistant. A second share goes to support research either in that laboratory or broader throughout the university. Other shares can go to the department of the inventor or the college of the inventor, and there is a share that comes or is retained by the technology transfer office. Typically, that's anywhere from between 15 and up to 25 percent. Therein lies the problem of why we're not seeing more technology come from laboratories into the marketplace. That amount of money is not sufficient to run a technology transfer office in large universities. Universities end up subsidizing that function. Let's think about this for a second. If you have a technology that is a drug, it's a blockbuster that produces billions of dollars of sales, and you got a small percentage of that, the royalty that comes back is pretty significant, tens of millions of dollars. You can operate an office on that kind of a royalty. That's a very rare event. That's kind of the way out on the tail of distribution of what royalties are all about. So if you think about the resources that come into a university, the expenditures of research, think of it as a pie. At some universities, a billion dollars. It's that drawdown of the 30 billion that I'm talking about. Others, 600 million, a couple hundred million, et cetera. And you think of that pie, and then you think of the size of the budget of a technology transfer office, less than 1%. So this, in essence, is a rate limiter on the transfer technology coming out of the laboratory. Now, a few years back, universities were asked, why don't we do this? Why don't we take a percentage of the research coming in and do a set-aside? Put that aside, and that money will be used for technology transfer. Research university said, no way. At a research university, research is preeminent. Technology transfer doesn't occur by happenstance. It's not a lightning bolt of an idea. It's years to get there. It's not luck that is the reason why we find a company and we license technology. I'm fortunate. I work at a university where the percentage is greater than 1%. Work for previously a president that gets it and a president now that gets it, wants to do more. But if we're gonna do more across the nation with all the research universities and get technology transfer to have more social impact, we gotta change the conversation. The conversation today is about how we can become efficient. What are the best practices? The conversation should be different. The conversation should be what's necessary to be able to transfer all that research into the marketplace. And then we'll talk about efficiency. I'd assert to you that 1% is not. I'd also say that 1% or any other percentage that goes into technology transfer will have a much greater social impact than if that same amount of money went to research. I just committed a heresy. I'm a heretic at universities by saying that. Research is preeminent. But if we're going to produce more from research at universities, we have to have that conversation. The conversation is, 
Yes, it's important to do research at universities, fundamentally important. But research for its own sake is not sufficient. It's also necessary to, have, to do research and transfer that research for the sake of benefit in the community. That conversation is not going on at universities. Thank you.